Welcome back to Hoosier Hardware. Today we're taking a look at a cooler from Arctic. And if you watch the channel for a while now, you know that I have reviewed several Arctic coolers in the past, but this one is a little bit unique because at least for me, this is the first Arctic AIO that I'm actually ever taking a look at. This is the Liquid Freezer 2, which just launched and it has a couple of extremely unique features that actually differentiate this thing from literally every other AIO that is out there right on the market, or at least out there right now on the market, including the fact that it's just a little bit cheaper than most, it has better cable management than most, it actually has active VRM cooling going on, though I have my doubts that that actually makes much of a difference. Regardless, there are a lot of cool things about this cooler, and uh, hey, it's not even an Asatec type of a uh, design. It's actually an in-house built cooler from Arctic. So like everything about this is cool and I'm super excited to take a look at it. So we're gonna do that right now. So before I reach over and grab that H100 IV2 in the background here, I wanna go over some of the very unique features of this Arctic cooler that actually differentiates it very much so from pretty much every other AIO on the market right now. And first and foremost, this is not an Asatec cooler. And for the end user, that's really not going to be a big make or break type of a deal. It's impossible right now to tell you whether or not Arctic's design is going to last over the long run. Obviously, Asatec coolers actually have a pretty solid track record at this point. So whether Arctic's in-house design is actually has the longevity here of an Asatec cooler, I don't know, and I'm sure down the road several years we will have a better idea here, but it is not an Asatec cooler, it is worth noting. Now, what is very unique about it, other than this almost like steampunk aesthetic going on, is we actually have a little fan there on the block itself, which circulates just a little bit of air around those VRMs. Now, I highly doubt that it gets us much airflow going on there, but any sort of air turbulence around these heat sinks for pretty much any higher end motherboard is gonna be much appreciated, especially because if you don't have a case that has a rear exhaust fan right by those, they might not get much air going over them and they will run warmer. And I will say with my experience with this cooler, that fan does not ramp up to be obnoxiously loud or whiny. It's very subtle in the background to the point where if it's in a case, I have absolutely no doubt you will not hear that little fan whatsoever. And even on an open air test bench, I really can't differentiate between the little fans noise, the pump noise itself, and then the fans on the actual radiator. So I will say the fan being there is not obnoxiously loud. If you really do hate it though, you could always just like cut the cable to that fan so it just sits idle. I don't know why you would do that on a brand new cooler that you just put in your system, but it is an option. Speaking of fans, we have two pre-installed fans on the radiator, and what I most love about this is the fan cables actually come out of the block itself and are run under this sheathing around the water tubes up until it comes out as a little bit of a fan splitter here. So you could replace these fans and still have the cables perfectly managed and run them through the tubing into the block, which then everything is managed with just one cable. And this is another thing that differentiates this cooler from pretty much everything out there on the market right now. There is no RGB and literally the entire cooler, both fans plus the water block are controlled through one PWM four pin header. And that is just so refreshing, especially for something like this on a test bench. I love the fact that I have only one header to worry about plugging in and that is literally the only cable on the entire thing I have to manage. Now the reason the tubes are like arcing over the radiator right now is because this is the pre-configured uh, fan configuration with this cooler. So presumably you would be mounting this either at the back of a case or possibly at the top of the case because the fans are pulling air from your, I believe your right, my left here, through the radiator this direction. Now you can take the fans off and put them on the other side of the radiator to create a, uh, an effect where you're pushing air through the radiator if you wanna put it at the front of a case, for example. But with that, the cable management at the radiator side might not be quite as tidy because you will have a fan cable wrapping from this tube going around the radiator itself. It's not really a big deal. I don't think most people are gonna bother really worrying about that too much when they're considering where to put the radiator, but it is worth noting. I left everything alone here just because this is the way the, uh, the AIO came out of the box. I didn't have to put anything on it. I just had to attach it to the test bench. So again, 
Just something worth noting though, you do have the flexibility to swap out the fans completely if you want or just flip them around to the other side or add, uh, I suppose you could even add another fan splitter there if you really wanted to and create a push-pull effect if that's an option that you were interested in, in doing as well. It's, it's a fantastic setup, at least out of the box. It looks really cool. So with all that said, I am gonna be comparing this AIO to the Corsair 100 IV2 over my shoulder. And uh, we're gonna see how these two 240 millimeter radiators do. But it is worth noting, the Arctic radiator is significantly thicker than most AIOs. In fact, it's almost 10 full millimeters thicker than the Corsair one. I measured it on the tape measure. It's right around 40 uh, millimeters. It's um, officially listed, I believe, as 38 millimeters. And the Corsair one was measured at right at 30 millimeters, maybe give or take a millimeter or two. So we do have quite a bit of a thicker radiator with this unit. So I do actually expect it to outperform the Corsair, but what I'm really curious is by how much. So before we get started here with the actual cooling testing, I did wanna make mention of the mounting mechanism here for AM4 coolers. Uh, the Arctic uses a lot and I cannot stand that they do it this way, but it, it sort of is what it is. So if you see in there, and, and I know it's kind of hard to see, it's pretty dark in there and that sort of thing, and the camera may not want to focus, but there is a screw that goes through the plate that holds on the cooler itself. So you put this screw through the hole and it screws into the back plate that comes with your AM4 motherboards. Now, the reason I don't like that is uh, Arctic actually came up with something much better. Oh, there goes the focus. Arctic actually came up with something much better here for LGA sockets. And this does support LGA 1150 sockets, any of those 51, 55, 56, all those sockets, as well as 2011 and 2066. Uh, the TR4 socket is not supported to my knowledge. So on an Intel motherboard, all you do here is you put this back plate on the back and you have these standoffs that screw through the motherboard uh, into the back plate. And these standoffs have this nice little uh, this nice little nub on the top of them here, which you will set the cooler on. And instead of putting a screw through the cooler's uh, bracket, you just put the cooler, you set it down on top of that, and then you put one of these little nuts on it. And that's what holds it down on an LGA socket. But for some reason, they decided not to do that with the AM4 ones, which is a complaint that I definitely had with uh, with some of their past coolers as well. Uh, the Arctic, uh, what was that? The Esports one, the uh, Freezer 33, I think, Esports one. But then the Freezer 34, they fixed it and used more of an LGA style bracket. So I don't really know why Arctic went with this direction for uh, AMD and not so much for Intel, but, uh, it is what it is. The good news is it's actually not hard to mount regardless, and uh, it was able to be done relatively simply. It's just one of those minor annoyances that I really don't quite understand why Arctic did it differently with AM4, but it was worth noting, so I wanna throw that out there. So testing for this cooler and the Corsair H100 IV2 is gonna be really simple. We're just gonna be using IDA64 here, and we're gonna run the CPU, FPU, and cache tests all together at the same time. While I know that just running FPU by itself will give us a hotter overall CPU, I'm not really all that concerned about it. I'm really more concerned with just making sure this quick and dirty overclock is stable. And the overclock that we're gonna be using with this setup is 1.4 volts running at 4.0 gigahertz on this Ryzen 1800X. And we're gonna run this test for 30 minutes and just kind of see what the temperatures look like when we're done. So with that, get the, uh, the clock pulled up here. There's our timer of 30 minutes. We're gonna go ahead and go down to the bottom corner here. And we are gonna click this start button. And over here, there we go. We'll be back in 30 minutes to see how well this guy is handling the 1800X at four gigahertz and 1.4 volts. We are just over three and a half minutes into the test and you'll notice here that we have started to stabilize on our temperatures. Now I fully expect those temperatures to continue to go up a little bit throughout the rest of the test, but it does look like we're probably gonna stabilize in the mid 60s, maybe a little bit higher by the time this is said and done. But we definitely see this chart starting to taper off a little bit as this loop starts to work towards equilibrium. 
Uh, I doubt it's quite there yet, but we are getting into a more stable state with temperature where we're not launching up the chart anymore. So if you're ever using IDA 64, obviously the red screen is not a good thing. So this test actually ended and it failed out at 22 minutes and 32 seconds. So I'm going to go over here and click on statistics and see just where we stand with some key things here. You'll notice the CPU averaged just shy of 60 degrees, though it was maxing out at 65 degrees there. And that was towards the end of the test. It was up at 65 degrees if we were looking just at the temperatures chart here. Now, we did see that line basically flat line, though. Once we hit about 65 degrees, it was pretty much flat the entire rest of the test. And then obviously it ended right there. So at 22 minutes, it was pretty stabilized as far as the temperatures go. Obviously, I'm much less concerned here about the actual stability of the overclock. So instead of just rerunning all these tests with a uh, better voltage or maybe slightly lower clocks, I'm actually just going to go ahead and throw the Corsair H100 IV2 on here and I hope that it lasts about 20 minutes and uh, we'll probably call that pretty much good enough as long as we can get to the point where we have a stabilized temperature something that we can at least get a similar comparison to because I'm not really trying to figure out the perfect scientific like average temperatures here which one is better than the other perfectly down to science here I'm basically trying to give a once over with which one at first take is better and this right now is the mark sorted to be at 65 degrees over about 22 minutes of a stress test. Okay, so I am just over two minutes into the Corsair H100 IV2's test, and already, yeesh, we're already up there, it just hit 70 degrees Celsius, and I do want to point out, this is actually at 3.9 gigahertz now, and that's because the 4.0 gigahertz crashed with 1.4 volts, so instead of going back through and retesting everything, I was just like, eh, drop down the clock speed to 3.9 gigahertz, and if it's close, I decided I would retest. But frankly, right now, even after it sort of uh, stabilizes in probably the low to mid 70s, I can't imagine this temperature dropping back down to 65 degrees. Now, to be fair to the Corsair H100 IV2 here, first of all, we have Noctua fans, which are probably not turning as fast as the Corsair ones that whine extremely loudly would. So, to be fair, the fans are probably not moving quite as much air as they would with the stock fans. The other thing I want to mention is this is not a brand new AIO. This Corsair H100 IV2 has been kicking around for quite a while, so it may have some gunk floating around in there that makes it a little bit less efficient. So there's no real perfect way of testing these two coolers together anyways. I am going to go ahead and let this test run out just to see where it ends up after about 20 to 30 minutes. But right now my bet is in the mid 70s, maybe low 70s, somewhere in that range. But right now it's looking not so great for this uh, very much used Corsair H100 IV2. Okay, so after 20 minutes, this is what we are left with. The Corsair H100 IV2 ended up stabilizing right around that 71 degree mark, even though it jumped up to 70 degrees really quickly. It had me nervous that it was going to keep climbing. But after 20 minutes, it is stable right there at 71, 72 degrees. It keeps bobbing sort of up and down right in that range. However, that is still another six degrees warmer than this Arctic Liquid Freezer 2. And frankly, the Freezer 2 here was also working with a 4.0 gigahertz overclock instead of 3.9 gigahertz. Uh, I am not going to retest that, at least not right now. And that's mostly because we're already looking at apples and oranges anyways. We're looking at different fans, different cooler designs in general. This one's an old cooler. The, the Arctic is a brand new cooler. So there's differences there. So this was never going to be a scientific perfectly one-to-one -one comparison but what i did want to figure out was is the arctic liquid freezer 2 a competent liquid cooler when compared to other 240 millimeter coolers in that regard absolutely and i am really right now pretty thrilled with the way this cooler just shaped out to be i i really didn't know what to expect when arctic said that they were 
uh, designing this as an in-house design, not using an Asetek pump and just sort of designing everything from the ground up themselves. I was really a little apprehensive, but it all works out really, really well. And uh, I really can't get over this. There's just one cable. The entire thing is literally one cable to plug in. And to be fair, the H100 IV2, I mean, it actually has decent cable management when you don't plug the USB in, but uh, it, it sort of has this uh, fan extension that comes off of it, but it's not managed like like this Arctic one is. So the Arctic cooler here, I am extremely happy with it, and I am happy to be able to say that I would definitely recommend this if you're looking at an AIO and your budget is sort of that 70 to $90 range. This thing would be fantastic. So that's really it, guys. This is the Liquid Freezer 2 from Arctic. Obviously, I'm very impressed with this cooler, especially at the current prices on Amazon, which I will leave that link down below. And that is a link to the 120, 240, 280, and 360 versions of this particular setup. And all of them right now are really good prices. So as far as price to performance goes, and just getting a really solid bang for your buck on an AIO cooler, it's really hard to recommend much else right now other than this Arctic unit just because you get the thicker radiator, you get the pre-run cables, you don't have to mess with the RGB. Now I do understand if you're someone that likes RGB, I get it. Uh, it would be nice to have, but at least the aesthetic is fairly neutral with the coloring and that sort of thing. You get active VRM cooling, it, it's it's just a really solid product that I am extremely happy was sent over. This thing now has a permanent seat on my test bench and uh, yeah, so those links are down below. I do want to know what you guys think, of course, about Arctic's first attempt here at an in-house design on their pumps. And then, of course, with this sort of brand new aesthetic they're coming out with, with that in-house non asetech design. And I just really want to know what you guys think about this cooler. I think it's really cool, but maybe you don't, and maybe you do. Let me know your thoughts down below. And of course, if you liked the video, give it a like, share, subscribe, and comment. All those things are helpful to the channel. You can follow me both on Instagram and on Twitter at Hoosier Hardware. And as always, I'll let YouTube queue up a couple more videos for my channel for you to watch. I'm Shane with Hoosier Hardware, and I'll see you guys in the next video.